Okay. Welcome everyone to our second lecture. I'll go ahead and share the notes and then we'll get started. All right. So first we'll go through a theological response on what the Bible says about creator God and creation. Okay, so this is more of a chapter and verse. This is what the Bible says. Then after that, we will get into a philosophical response. Let's see how much we can cover today. And then we'll continue this next week. So if you look at it from a theological response, what are the same things that we can say? First, we say the Bible teaches us that God is an infinite being, like we said, infinite in time power and understanding. He always existed because he is self-existent. So God is self-existent. So somebody say, if somebody thinks they're asking a very smart question, if God created the universe, who created God? Huh? Ah, so they think a very smart question. It's actually a very foolish question because <laughs> Because why the very fact, the very say we call somebody God <laughs> means he is God and God is self-existent. He doesn't depend on anybody or anything for his existence. Right? So that question itself is an invalid question. Who created God? Well, if somebody created God, then that person <laughs> is God. Right? Yes, uh, right. People who are asking like this question, they are not believing the person who is God. Oh. The people who is asking the question, mm -hmm. uh, who created God, they are not believing the God. They are not believing God, yeah. yeah. They are not believing, and it's like a, there is a person called to God. Mm. So, how it being like Yeah, so, so then they are asking a question for the sake of argument. You know, just to argue. Well, by definition, God is infinite in time, power, and wisdom, understanding. And God, by definition, is self-existent. So the fact that they don't believe in God, and uh, then they ask this question, who created God? Uh, okay, if you're asking a question who created God well we are saying God by definition is infinite and self-exist so the being who we call God is a self-existent being he doesn't depend on anyone else for his existence now if you don't believe in that that does not make the invalid question any more valid the question is invalid because, by definition, uh, God is self-existent. Right? So, uh, and we see this in scripture many, Psalm 90 verse 2, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That means uh, there was no beginning, no end. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Uh, Psalm 147, 4 and 5, our great is our God, mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. There is no, you know, there's no limit to his understanding. Same thing in Isaiah 40, uh, some of these verses we've listed here. Verse 18, you know, how can you liken God? How can you compare him? Right? So we are trying to understand the infinite with what is finite. Like our understanding is about finite things, and we are trying to understand the infinite in the term in terms of the finite. So there will be always limitations. There can be some understanding, but not full understanding, because he's infinite, and our understanding is only about finite things. So God is the verse twenty-eight Isaiah forty twenty-eight. He is the everlasting God. Uh, he neither faints; his understanding is unsearchable. Second thing is, the Bible tells us God created the universe. 
the bible is very clear on that so we're giving a theological response right and when we're saying this is what the bible says um so in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth that means what you're seeing out there we call it the universe what you're seeing in the universe the heavens and the earth on the planet everything there in the universe on the planet god created god caused to come into being now all things john 1 verse 3 all things were made through him right uh, genesis 2 says the heavens and the earth finished god uh, rested from the work he had done and the bible also says that in six days the lord did everything so we'll get into those details right how how that happened so this is another thing the bible says in six days god created everything now according to science uh Earth evolved over billions of years. The Earth is supposed to be, I don't know, four billion years old, um, and uh, you know everything happened over time. There was, you know, we, we will we will study this. Uh, the Big Bang theory says, you know, way back in time, about fourteen billion years ago, uh, there was an explosion, and then the whole, all of the universe came into being, and then over time. Things happen on this planet that gave rise to life, and then over millions of years of evolution, finally you and I came. So, according to these theories, it took billions of years and of processes to bring us to where we are. But according to the Bible, in six days, God created the heavens and the earth. So, how do we? reconcile the two right so that brings us to the third point god created the heavens and the earth in its initial mature form can the bible is very clear about that that in the creative act of god everything was created in a very mature so when we read Genesis chapter 1, God, different things were created on different days. And uh, for example, when God said, let there be birds in the sky and creatures in the sea, they came into being and they came into existence in their mature form. And God said, let us make man Adam was not created like a little cell. He was created as a man. So, maybe two seconds after Adam rose up from the ground, if God brought Adam to you and said, how old is this man? You might say, maybe 30 years old. I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. God, it's only two seconds. Just, it just came out from the ground. It just came, just two seconds, he stood up. You think 30 years. So what, what, what do we say? That in the creative act of God, time, energy, and intelligence was compressed. Time, energy, and design, intelligence. It all came together in that moment. Why is this important? Because for us, intelligence is an evolutionary process. It grows gradually. It takes millions of years for us. Huh? We, the, the theory of evolution. But for God, He is infinite in wisdom. He has no problem in bringing it into realization, a material form, in, in some expression, in an instant. So, we say, well, the star, see how much of energy. One sun is so much of energy, it's emitting so much of energy. Therefore, 
uh, for those stars to have come together would have taken millions and millions and millions of years for those gases to come together and start this reaction to give out so much energy. God said, no, I just said stars be, stars came. Huh? He is infinite in power. Right? So in the creative act of God, God brought time, power, and design together in an instant. For us, when we break it down, oh, it will take millions of years for something like this to happen. So much of intelligence to come together, it will take millions of years. How it can come in one second? God did it. So the age they calculate about the stars, age of the stars, and uh, so, uh, so it doesn't uh, point out accurately. Sorry, the age of the stars or the Earth that the scientists are calculating right now uh, doesn't accurately point out to the original existence of the Earth, right? Like the original time when God created the Earth, or does it? It does not. Because, remember, scientific calculation is not precise, right? It is based on certain theories, and that, that keeps on changing. Like, maybe there was a time when people said Earth was 4 million years old. Then they said, no, 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 that's not it. We got new calculation. Now, according to our calculation, it's 10 million years. Then, no, 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 it must be 1 billion. No, no, change, change. Now it's 4 billion, change. So. It's not a precise thing. It's something we are trying to estimate based on certain things. So it keeps on changing over time. Right? So the estimation of the age of this universe or the age of the Earth or the age of a certain planet or something, it is an estimation. It's something that is based on what we think we know at that time. and that will keep changing okay as we discover something or learn something more we will we could revise that that is i'm talking from from a scientific perspective so it's not necessarily it is not the actual time in which god created the universe because if we go according to um, scripture about so, and we will study Genesis chapter 1 and carefully, verse by verse. About 6,000 years, 6,000 years in calendar time. About 6,000 years. We go back in time, but we can trace the history of the human race. And somewhere there, God said, let there be light. So we don't know exactly. Right? We know from Adam's time. Okay, God said, uh, let the, let, let's create man. So he created Adam. From Adam's time, we have account. Right? So we can say roughly, roughly, according to Bible, from the time of Adam, it's about 6,000 years. And we will calculate, we will go back in that. But then somebody says, but according to my measurement, the earth is so many 4 billion years old. You're saying it's only 6,000. It is okay. Why? Because your 4 billion years was compressed in the moment. But what, you know, the point I'm trying to make is what we think would have taken 4 billion years to make happen. In the creative act of God, it was in an instant. Right? Because everything was created in a mature form. Right? So fine, according to our calculation, according to our understanding, we are saying 4 billion years, but God said, I just created it. I compressed 4 billion years in an instant. Right? So think about this. Think about this. When we see a miracle, water is turned to wine. Can we do it today? We cannot. How you can change H2O to some alcohol? You know, 
those compounds are not even there. Only hydrogen, oxygen is there in the pot. And suddenly you're getting grape juice. <laughs> How scientifically it's impossible. But it is there. It is a creative act. It came into existence. Right? Uh, or when you multiply phylos and two fish. You cannot. Right? So according to science, matter is neither created nor destroyed. It only changes the form. Uh, but you got phylos two fish. <laughs> and I know so much more bread came out of the phylos. That means matter was created. So much more bread came. You had five loaves of bread. But 5,000 people ate. Matter was created. How was it created? And it was created as bread, not wheat flour, not some other, not even in the form of grain. It was created as bread in, in a very, very mature form, in the right texture. Everybody eating bread is the same like that. That was made, this was created. But it was done in a mature form, in the right mixture, everything. So you say, in the bakery, how long will it take to make the bread? Three hours. But this took three seconds. <laughs> the moment it came, it came out as bread. I'm just giving examples, right, that we can see where in the creative act of God, what may have taken for us uh, a, a lot of time, uh, a lot of processes, everything happened like that. In a thing. But if you ask somebody, this is bread. To make this bread, it will take three hours. But no, 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 no. It just happened. In, in a, less than a second, it happened. So that is the creative act of God, where time, energy, and design are all compressed in, in an instant. Right? So it is not contradicting, meaning, if somebody says, to make bread, it will take three hours, correct. I'm not denying that. It will take three hours to make bread. That is correct. But that is a natural process. But I'm telling right now, when this miracle happened, it took less than a second. I broke the bread, it became, <laughs> it became more bread. It took less than a second. So... We're not saying that this, this natural thing is wrong, it is correct. That means, according to your calculation, according to what we have understanding, that is a correct understanding only. But this is a creative act of God, which is outside the scope of that understanding. So what may have taken three hours, he did it in an instant. He created bread, fish for everybody. So now we think of it, in the scale of a uh, universe. Right? So in the creative act of God, everything was created in mature form. Second thing that we also understand in creation from the Bible is, God placed recurring natural processes and systems in creation. So God in Genesis chapter 1 itself, he said, let the earth bring forth fruit and trees. And let the fruit has seed in itself. What he's saying? He's saying, I'm creating something, but I'm also putting in place a process for this to continue on and on and on. So uh, these plants are grow. They bring fruit. Fruit has seed. Seed goes in the ground. Plant comes again. Then there's fruit. Fruit has seed. Seed goes in the ground. Again it comes. So... There's a natural process God set. So he's not creating every tree after that. He created the first tree or trees. And in that he set a natural process. You keep multiplying. And he put system in place where you put the seed in the ground. Rain will come. Water will come. Seed will germinate. It will become a plant. Plant will grow. 
will bear fruit. Fruit will have seed. That seed goes back to the ground. So he put that in place. It will keep on repeating. So the so God created, but he also set this process in place. So when we look at the tree today, we're not saying this tree God came himself and planted it. No. It, it is here because in Genesis, he set a process in place uh, for it to propagate. So it is a natural process. So whatever we are seeing around us, it is there because a natural process was set in place on the earth from the beginning. So trees keep Trees, plants, birds, animals, humans keep on propagating. Right? And then the third point we must understand in creation is that God entrusted the earth to man. Hmm? Psalm 115 verse 16, the heavens belong to God, but the earth he has given to the children of men. That means he put man in charge of the earth. That's important to understand. Okay. Another thing the Bible teaches us, point four, is creation itself is evidence of the creator. So this is a theological response. And it will also come under, uh, later on we'll see there's a philosophical side to it, a logical side to it. But... The Bible itself is saying, okay, you can't see God, but you can see His creation. And God is saying, my creation is my proof to you that I am here. So when the atheist says, there is no proof, say, hey, you're looking at the proof. You are a proof that there is a God. Now, after seeing the proof, if you say, I don't believe, that is a different matter. That means you are choosing to reject the proof. But you can't say there is no proof. You are a proof. Creation around you is proof that there is a God. Right? So look at Romans 1, verse 19 to 22. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them so you know whatever you want to know about god you see you are there you are there it's manifest in them but god has shown it to them but since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen so he's saying look god is invisible but his invisible attributes can be seen how being understood by the things that are made. Look at creation. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So he's saying, you know, uh, the things that are made, God's power, God's God, the who God is, they, are, they can be seen through his creation. And so we have no excuse. Verse 21, because Although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. So, the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen, understood by the things that are made. So, the Bible is telling us, that we can learn about God through His creation. Through the finite, we can understand something about the infinite. God is so big. But we can understand some things. His invisible attributes, His intelligence, His wisdom, His greatness can be seen in His creation. Yeah. So, example, Psalm 19. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows us handiwork. Day unto day at a speech, night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. 
the line has gone up through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. That means no matter where you are on the earth, when you look up at the sky, at the heavens, God, God's glory is being shown to you. The heavens declare the glory of God. How great God is. How infinite He is. So how many stars? How big this universe? And he says, wherever you are on the earth, no excuse. You are able to see. If you had to see the heavens only from North Pole, the people in South Pole say, okay, I never went there. I don't know. <laughs> no, chance, no excuse for you. From South Pole also, you can see. You look up, you're seeing the universe. Whichever direction you're seeing, the heavens are declaring. Heavens are speaking to you. That God is so infinite. Right? Or... You can look at the human body. Psalm 139 verse 14. For I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and my soul knows very well. So even the human body is so fearfully and wonderfully made. And it's declaring how great God is. Right? The fool, Psalm 14 verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So can you imagine? In the Bible, fool equals atheist. <laughs> the atheist has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So just think about it. It's very, very strong. Right? So when these scientists, the highly educated, they may have many PhDs after their name, and they say, there is no God. According to the Bible, you are a fool. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But on the earth, they may be considered very, you know, wise. Oh, this is scientist so-and-so. He's got so many PhDs. According to the Bible, it says a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So foolish to say there is no God. Right? So, um, so that, you know, there is, um, uh, there's this little quote here um, when uh, Bertrand Russell is challenged and he says, you know, when I see God, I'll ask him, why did you give so little evidence of your existence? But actually, God has given us so much evidence of his existence in his creation. You look at the universe, oh, so big. So amazing. And we will look at it from a scientific perspective. You'll see like there's so many things that could not have happened by chance in the universe. So many things. The position, for example, the position of the earth. If we were even a little closer, we would all become fried chicken. Gone. Too hot. Little further. Too cold, all frozen, frozen chicken. <laughs> the earth is in such a precise location from the sun. It's tilted at a certain angle and it's rotating around the sun. It's like, could this have happened by accident? No, it is so precise. And like this, so many things. Uh, that are so precise, you begin to wonder, how could this have happened by chance? Then you look at, uh, you know, look on the earth itself, you look at the plants, how all, you know, people, we have been spending so much time studying about different kinds of plants. Let's try to study how the water comes from the soil, goes into the and the plants grow and all that. It's just the whole... Could all this have happened by chance? Then think about the animals. Then think about the human body. And you go into the cellular level, the single cell. And you begin to look at it and say like, wow, so amazing. Could these... How could this have happened by accident? It's no. So wherever you look, you look in the universe, you look in nature around you, look at yourself. 
there is so much evidence that there is God. The fingerprint of God is everywhere. Everywhere. You can't escape. Then if you say, God, you gave me no evidence. No wonder God is saying, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It's like, what can I do more than this? Hmm? The fool has said, there is no God. Right. So that is theological. That is chapter and verse. Now, let's change a little bit. Let's uh, see, you know, let's try to do one or two. Let's give a philosophical response. When we say philosophical, it means we are just uh, thinking. It's logic. It's reasoning. Just reasoning. I think. So a philosophical reason. First, cause and effect. So there is the law of cause and effect. It's very simple, actually. We are sitting in this room. Suppose a ball comes flying in this room. I was imagine the window was open and ball came flying. And if I said, it just happened. <laughs> it just happened. So, you know, what will be our first question? Who threw the ball? Or who hit the ball? You know, something. There is a cause. The effect is ball is flying in the room. You cannot have an effect without a cause. It is non-existent. But the atheist wants us to believe that you can have an effect without a cause. So he's basically saying, if you ask the question, where did the ball come from? How did it come? No, no, it just came. It just came. And you have to believe it just came. No, no, but we say there is a cause. Somebody must have thrown it. Somebody must have hit it. Somebody must have made the ball first. <laughs> it just came. It's not a valid, not a valid, not a valid thing, right? Sean, you have a question. Hmm. Uh, I know they say uh, you no know, everything is created with the big bang. That's the theory. I mean, even if there's a big bang, there's something that has to cause the bang in order to happen. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. mean, that's, that's what I want to say. Right. Right. All right. So there, every effect has to have a cause. So this is a philosophical statement. That means just simple logic, simple reasoning. Can there be an effect without a cause? It is non-existent. Right? So you apply that to the universe. Whatever had a begin, whatever has a beginning has a cause behind it. The universe had a beginning, therefore the universe had a cause for its existence. Second. Philosophical statement, which is also something theological that we can prove from scripture, which is um, creation attests to a creator. Design calls for a design. So if I put this mobile phone here and I told you, over 35 billion years, the mobile phone just assembled itself. You would think this guy has to be in the mental asylum. <laughs> I'm saying, no, no, no. 35 billion years. Over 35 billion years. Somehow, everything assembled. <laughs> and this phone came here. How does the phone have all these apps? They just came together. <laughs> and then, how does you know? How does the phone know it to give Indian time? It just happened. 
you will surely say something is wrong with this phone. <laughs> he has to go to the... now. This phone is only a small part of this universe. The universe is much more complicated than this phone. There are so many things around in this world, in the universe. But what we know, everything had to have a designer. Somebody designed and somebody made the phone. It didn't happen by chance. So there was a lot of thoughts, you know. So everything, this was made, somebody, there was a maker. Or there were many people who put their minds together to make it. It just didn't happen at random. So that's why I say, hey, there is creation. There has to be a creator. There is design in this. There is so much design. There has to be a design. Right? So just a, just a philosophical argument or a logical thinking. That's all. I think complicated, very simple. Uh, all right. Well, just um, maybe mention one more or see how much time we have. Third thing is this morality and rationality. Okay. This cup is made of, I think, some ceramic. Okay, let's say this is a clay cup, mud made from mud. Exam. Can this cup have the ability for morality to know what's right and wrong? No, it's just clay. Can this cup have the ability to think and reason? It's just clay. So think about us, example, human beings. This body, physical body, and this brain is actually matter. 75% of this body is only water. So this is a walking water bottle. 75% <laughs> is water. Right? And then it has cells, it has bones and things like that. But it's all matter. It will all go back to dust. So literally it is dust. But there are two things about this matter. That means this matter has the sense of morality, right and wrong. Where did that come from? Because technically, there is no difference between this physical matter and this physical matter. It is just physical matter. It will go back to the dust. But if you look at it as matter, if this body is just matter, you put it in the ground, it will decay. It will become mud after some time, just like this cup. But this matter has sense of morality. It also has sense of rationality. Yeah, I can think. So these are two big things. Morality and rationality. Where did that come from? If you keep this cup here for many billions of years, can this cup suddenly evolve morality and rationality? No, never. Keep it how long you want. 10 billion years. It is matter. It won't, it won't acquire. It won't develop morality and passion. It can only be given to it. Right? So that is another third thing. There is something about us. We have the sense of right and wrong. Where did that come from? Right and wrong. And we also have the ability to think rationality.
if we were just matter if this universe was just matter how could matter acquire something that is beyond itself morality and eh? yes. this is very unique it had to be given to us so lifeless matter cannot produce the mind or morality god gave it to us because god is a moral being he is holy he is just he is pure so he gave that aspect of morality to us so we have sense of right and wrong oh, this is right this is wrong right so uh, what happened to my And uh, one more, we can uh, point to supernatural phenomena. So we see supernatural things happening, and so that points to the existence of God. Okay, let's pause here. But these are four philosophical thoughts. So first, we looked at theological chapter and verse about God and creation. Philosophical, we can. You know, present these things when we are talking to people. And just say, think about it. Think about it. Right? We'll pick up here uh, from point number four and go on, and then we will then slowly move into the aspect of faith and science. We'll introduce uh, we'll introduce the idea of science, and uh, you can be a person of faith and still uh, have a handle on science. Science is not against faith. We will explain that. And then we'll go into looking at things from a scientific point. But we'll pick up here. Okay, we'll pick up here next week. Any questions? Let me just check online chat. Um, any questions from our online class? Uh, Prince, is, Prince, what happened to Prince? Oh, oh okay. So that's why he's joined us online. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, online students, any questions from anybody? Okay. Fine. So we'll just continue this. Think about these things, and uh, we will develop this further next week. Okay. Uh, can somebody please uh, pray? Um, take the mic and pray, and we will close and dismiss. Jesus, we thank you for this time, for this day that we have together, Lord, um, to come to know more about your word, to know that you exist. And uh, Lord, I pray that um, uh, as we uh, learn and go through this Christian apologetics, that I pray, Lord, that you would increase our faith in you and that um, we would um, be bold enough, the Father God, to share the message of the of the cross lord jesus and um thank you jesus for everything that we learned today i pray that we would be able to remember it and uh thank you lord for this time in your name i pray amen amen okay thank you everyone god bless bye now